All right, so welcome back to Nuggets on the Go banter series. And today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic. And in particularly, we're going to talk about on-block sales in Singapore. Because you could take a potential view of where the market trend is likely to take place. And why is that important? Is because when you start an on-block, and by the time that you actually get your 80% put it up market, it might well be a year after you initiate it could be year plus and you know how it is Singapore's market tends to be dynamic right with us today we have Mr. Kramjit Singh renowned expert uh, can I call you an expert Mr. Kramjit hopefully not <laughs> <laughs> it adds more pressure <laughs> alright <laughs> Onblock sales has been, uh, of course, highly sought after topic, uh, especially uh, starting from 2021 all the way, surprisingly, until the Q1 portion of 2023. Because later, as we deep dive, there are quite a lot of uh, news actually on a uh, couple of onblock sales that's happening. Of course, a lot of uh, projects has also been put up for onblock tender as well. And later, we're going to deep dive with uh, quite a fair bit of questions for Mr. Kramjit. So, just a quick introduction uh, on Mr. Kramjit. He is currently the CEO of uh, Show Suite as well as uh, Dilasa. And uh, he has more than uh, 30 years of experience in the real estate industry. So just a quick glimpse on his experience uh, previously uh, with uh, Collis as a, as a kickstart of his uh, real estate journey. And then he set up uh, Credo Real Estate. And uh, after that, uh, in Jones Lang, uh, LaSalle, um, on which uh, he then set up his current two companies, uh, which uh, Dilasa deals with uh, consultancy, on-block sales, as well as um, uh, high-end investment sales as well for property uh, owners. And of course, ShowSuite is a technology company uh, that uh, collaborates and assists uh, developers on their new launch projects. And we'll, we'll deep dive later on some of the things that he's working on. So welcome, Kranjit. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> right. Great to have you here because um, it's not easy to find uh, an on-block uh, expert uh, in the market. And uh, maybe uh, a quick introduction to our audience. Share with us a little bit about um, your experience in the, in the on-block scene. And uh, of course, I think uh, our audience is very keen to know some of the projects that you have worked on in the past that has been successful as well. Yeah, so on-block is clearly a very hot and at the same time sensitive topic amongst uh, private property owners. It involves money and involves potentially being forced out of your homes. Uh, sometimes it does get dramatic, but most of the times not. It usually leads to very happy outcomes. Um, and But because it could potentially be disruptive on one hand, it could potentially be profit making on the other hand, uh, especially if the owners are looking at it from an investor's lens, uh, it naturally becomes a very uh, lucrative and important topic for people to want to track. Um, on block typically happens when the value of the land far uh, exceeds the sum total value of the parts. So it's, it gives rise to an arbitrage. And why do we face that in Singapore? And why is this a fairly uniquely Singapore phenomena? Is number one, we've got a very small island market um, and wealth has been on the rise. Um, we are accommodating more and more population. Um, so that gives rise to the need to intensify existing use of property. While the government is the major supplier of land that gives rise to condominiums, which is the predominant uh, uh, form of housing in the private space. Uh, but many a times it does make sense for us to see our old properties be recycled for new properties and put to better, more productive use. So on that, from that perspective, uh, the government felt that uh, it, it is a phenomena to be supported and which is why uh, they took a view that they should actually make it easier to actually facilitate on blocks without requiring all the owners to agree to a proposition, but at the same time, the necessary safeguards to ensure that the interests of the minorities who have not agreed to it, their interests are duly protected. So that legislation got kicked in in 1999 that paved the way for 80%, generally 80%, of the owners to consent to an on-block proposition 
prior to that, when it all got started in 93, 94, which is basically 30 years ago, uh, it did require everybody to agree. And that gave rise to quite a number of wrong practices, undesirable uh, behavior, profit-taking, uh, and, and very distasteful conclusions to some of the deals. Mm, right. So, um, would you be able to share with us, like, um, through a journey in real estate, uh, what has been some of the projects that you have been involved in uh, in the past? Okay, so we've been involved with, um, in different capacities, I mean, I've kind of worked under in Colliers, then GLL, then I set up Credo uh, and ran that for 10 years. And then after that, uh, we merged with GLL. So I had two stints with GLL. And throughout that 30-year um, uh, process, I think it's been close to 100 on blocks that I'd been involved with in one form or the other. The biggest in the market um, in our history, in Singapore's history, is Farrakhan. Um, and that still stands to be the largest ever successfully uh, organized on block um, involving 600 over uh, apartment owners amounting to 1.3 over billion dollars. So in quantum, in land mass, land size, uh, it still stands to be the largest. And so, and, and this obviously was a very team effort um, and we were very proud and very uh, well privileged to be involved with that success. Right. So um, that, of course, uh, in, in today's term will be deleted. That's and, correct. And um, in your perspective, will will such a huge uh, on block ever happen again uh, based on today's um, cooling measures, the, the new restrictions and, and, and things like that? Yep. So you've hit it right, Neil. Um, so s large scale is no longer... A, a positive attribute. Uh, it unfortunately has become a handicap and that's arising from uh, measures that forces developers to buy, build and sell any project almost irrespective of the scale and the size or the number of units within five years. Mm -hmm. So whether it is five apartments that they're building, five homes they're building or 500 units or 5,000 units, they still got five years to buy, build and sell. And bear in mind, within the five years, one year is typically taken uh, with the planning, designing, preparation for launch. So in all sense, it's about four years. So when you've got a mega scale project involving say more than 1,000 or 1,005 or 2,000, then that's where the risk escalates quite extraordinarily. And that's where developers will say, well, I'll rather spread my capital across multiple and smaller projects than lumping all into one large ones. Right. Maybe talk a little bit about this, of course, very famous project, Mandarin Gardens, right? Um, so uh, I think uh, the most recent attempt was like um, maximum at about 68%. And um, of course, this, this project has been one of the, the key favorites that a lot of people are looking at. Uh, plus there was another mega one which is at uh, Braddell. Yeah, so do you think this these two developments um, in the event if let's say one day they could achieve a 80%, what kind of uh, configuration will developers uh, do it in terms of uh, having a successful tender bid? Would they like combine forces or like usually what do you think will be the calibration for this kind of mega projects if it were to happen? Well, I think you know, the, before that actually can materialize, right. uh, I think it's about assessing and mitigating the risk mm. uh, on the part of the developer in undertaking any large and super large, and, and whether it's Mandarin Gardens, whether it's Bradle View, whether it's many out there that they do want to attempt. Um, the, the key challenge is the commercial risk around um, needing to pay the penalty for failing to sell out all the units, which is a real issue. So if most developers can't wrap their heads around that risk and the costs associated with the failure to meet the requirements, then um, very likely developers will just say, well, we'll just shy away from it. It's not a matter of pricing. It's just how do we uh, price in the commercial risk. Mm. Um, so, so that would generally be our advice to the mega scale on blocks. Right. And, and that's nothing taking away uh, from the attractiveness of these projects. And these are all, uh, you know, they've got, they enjoy very attractive attributes from a marketing perspective, but it's just the scale has now become a handicap. 
Right, right. Um, I think for today's podcast, what we want to achieve is also to to come from um, three different perspectives. One is through the lenses of uh, existing owners in such projects that has uh, on-block potential. The second one will be from the developer's point of view on what some of the factors that attracts them to actually bid for a development. Third one will be from the lens of uh, individual retail uh, home purchases that you know maybe some some uh, purchases they love older developments because of the vast landscape open parking and stuff like that but should they actually take the risk to to buy developments because maybe after owning it for one year they renovated it and then an, uh, they call for on block and stuff like that so maybe we can start from the first perspective uh want to want to put your your top process a little bit uh just to give an introduction of uh the generic sales process uh of uh starting from the the process of forming a committee usually uh on a uh, sequential approach how does this work if um, we're coming from an existing condo owner point of view right so I think the first thing they need to do is to get some advice as whether fundamentally is that project ready for an on block in that given market uh, of course you could take a potential view of where the market trend is likely to take place and why is that important is because when you start an on block and by the time that you actually get your 80 percent put it up in the market um, it might well be a year after you initiate it, could be a year plus. So, and you know how it is, Singapore's market tends to be dynamic. Um, so a general sense of market movements is important, getting an honest assessment of uh, the premium an on-block can deliver to the owners. Um, and, and, and again, whether the owners would be better off having unblocked it, received that premium, and bearing in mind that if that's a home, they would need to replace the home. And if they've got configuration, size, preferences um, that can be easily met by buying resale homes, um, whether it's, you know, they're looking at, uh, you know, a lateral move, an upgrade or a downgrade, then they will have to assess, um, you know, whether that can truly deliver a, a happy premium, a happy outcome, so to speak. Um, what we've seen of late is many on blockers don't mind um, enjoying a lesser premium because it is an opportunity to realize a dream to downgrade. So when you're downgrading, then you tend to be more forgiving with your options available uh, in when buying a replacement home because it's all about maybe downsizing or potentially uh, buying a HDB flat um, and, and enjoying the savings uh, which will help uh, their later years in life. Um, so that's one profile. Then there's obviously another profile that's looking at a upgrade to their housing form arising uh, from that premium or the profits or so and can that deliver um, we've also seen a situation and, and it's a it's probably a new manifestation of a new problem is most of the on-block projects and those the wannabes tend to have apartments where the sizes are large because compared to the new age apartments where developers are beginning to build smaller and smaller and they are beginning to struggle with replacement of as large a size as they enjoy currently for the sums of money that they will be receiving. And that's a genuine uh, issue and challenge most large apartment owners are facing. So because of the variety of unique challenges we have seen lots of on blocks that have come onto the market with 80% mandate, uh, but they have failed to find a buyer. Um, and that success rate um, and is dropping. And what I mean by that is that there have been multiple on block cycles. It comes, goes, comes and goes. And but this current on block cycle is probably one of those cycles with the lowest success rate or probability of success mm. and that's because of this new new found challenge unique challenge where the current profile of on blocks are struggling to find suitable suitably large apartments as replacement because most of the new age apartments are very small and they're not accustomed to it right usually um how many years is a cycle um 
Good question. Uh, look back in history, we've had mega cycles, we have mini cycles, and usually uh, it's about five year gap between a mega and a mini, and then another five years later for another mega, and then it tends to be a mini or so. So it's up and down, but within the ups and down, you've got the large ones and the not so large right. ones. So, so 2023, are we in a mega or mini We're cycle? We're in a mini, <laughs> mini cycle. We're in a mini cycle and, uh, and even within the mini cycle, <laughs> it's a mini cycle with a low probability of success. Right. So which is unique. You forecast that the next mega cycle will be 2028? Well, if you go back in history and you look at what constitutes, what drives... Um, cycles, ups and downs, and what gives rise to on blocks, then yeah, that we could be looking at another mega one, right. maybe four or five years from now. Right, right. You only seem like you have a question for Kronjit. Oh, no, no, I think because 0708 was uh, one of the mega cycles. That's where uh, Farrah Court was on block. That's right. And then 2017, 2018, we have another high cycle. Mega, like 2018, yeah. we have like 10.8 billion mm. in terms of uh, the value of on block. And then uh, last year was about 3.6 billion, right? So like we are yep. currently at like the mini cycle uh, version of it. But of course, Ferrer Court still stands at the only uh, property that has an unblocked value above 1 billion. Of course, there are some projects that are trying to challenge that. But we have, I'm just very curious because you mentioned that uh, the risk factors of uh, developers going for this mega site due to the five-year additional buyer stamp duty gap if they fail to finish the sales of all the properties. Uh, but actually over the last, let's say in the 2017, 2018 on block cycle, actually all those uh, big sites, the developer actually performed very well. Like for example, uh, Park Estar, Jetscape, St uh, sorry, uh, Park Estar, Jetscape, uh, Florence, Florence Residences, yeah. Treasure at Tampines, but they're all from HUDC, of course. That's correct. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on like the, some of the remaining HUDCs like Laguna Park? Ivory Heights and a better view, etc. Yeah, so you're right. Um, Park Esther is about, I think, about 1,400 units. Then you've got uh, other projects that were successful, delivering also about 1,400, 1,600. And I think the largest that stands right now is Treasury at Tampanese, which is 2,200. They turn out okay because the market was mm. on their side. Um, and you know how it is, the market could well not be on your side when you're holding the inventory and you've got only four years mm. of play there. Uh, bearing in mind the first year and maybe potentially slightly more than a year goes down to planning, preparation for launch. So uh, again, when you look back in time, the market saved many of these developers. Um, and if the market was not as buoyant, not as strong as they were and they have been, then it could have led to detrimental uh, situations, which many prudent and large developers will have to price in the risk. Mm. So if it doesn't come to that situation where they need to pay, then that's fine. But you will have to price that in just out of prudence. Because I was just thinking that actually for developers, it, were, it is always easier to just go for government land sales. They, yep. don't need to play, uh, they don't need to top up the premium. They don't need to pay the development charge, etc. And then they... So all, all these risks that you mentioned. True. So uh, GLS represents the most plain vanilla form, uh, usually with lesser hidden issues uh, that, that might lead to a delay in getting the new project approved design or so. Um, so the turnaround period tends to be much quicker. Mm. Uh, not much quicker, but I, I should not say that, but quicker quicker and more straightforward. straightforward. Uh, and bearing in mind this um, five-year rule, uh, the, 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 the design of the GLS land parcels typically give rise to about five to 600 units. And I think that's the sweet spot. Mm. Um, that's what developers love. That's the optimal size um, because they also need some degree of scale to make it cost efficient, uh, some economies of scale there, but not too large that it becomes a handicap. Mm, right. And um, by default, would you think that a developer will always prefer a GLS compared to on block? Because sometimes on block can be complicated in, in the sense and they still have to spend additional time to tear down and, and things like that. So the demolition is not a problem. Mm. Um, usually processes 
are fairly standard. So I think on blocks in itself is not a problem from a developer's perspective. Um, I think the answer to that is um, the value proposition, the price at which it comes to the market right. uh, and the location. I'll give you an example. If it's mass market, uh, most of the end buyers of the homes are used to 99-year leasehold uh, condominiums. Uh, so whether it's a GLS product or whether it is a uh, treasure and tempanese type of product, um, uh, it caters to the same end audience. But when you're dealing with high-end luxury homes, like say those close to Orchard Road, many a times the home buyers would insist on freehold or nothing. Mm. So, and that can't be sourced from the government land sales program because the GLS program by default sells leasehold properties. And the only source or credible source for land for such luxury homes uh, with freehold uh, title comes from on-block sales. Mm. So the answer to that, it depends. Right. And uh, just to deviate a little bit, I mean, now in the year 2023, our GLS, uh, in terms of launch pricing uh, for OCR is already $2,000 upwards yeah. uh, all the way to 2003, 2004. And then RCR is at $2,400 upwards as well. And then of course, CCR will be um, two eight three thousand dollars $3,000 onwards. So wh where do you think this will lead us to in the next five years? Like how, how are pricing going to, to look like? Maybe uh, by 2028, what is your own opinion on the GRS pricing? Okay, so that's an entirely, <laughs> entirely different subject yeah. altogether. Um, so if now if the question is more around, uh, you know, general movement of our homes here in Singapore, um, then I think you need to take a step back as to why are they still so resilient, so buoyant, despite the fact that we went through a major uh, economic crisis uh, driven by COVID that brought many economies, uh, markets down, uh, and also the new headwinds, which is high interest rates. Uh, despite, of the, b despite of these two factors, uh, our, property, our home prices have remained resilient, buoyant. Not only that, rentals also have gone up. The reasons for that, multiple. Um, Singapore's real estate size is limited, and, and that's very uh, profound, that's fundamental. Um, many cities can grow and grow and grow sideways. We can't. We can only grow upwards. And we do need to grow because we are supporting a larger and larger population base. Naturalized Singaporeans as well as uh, uh, by, through immigration. So that's the direction that we are heading towards too. GLS does uh, form the bulk of the supply, but on blocks also help fill in the gaps where needed. Um, so on one hand, uh, we've got these factors. On the other hand, you've got unique factors such as high savings amongst our households here. And it's a huge phenomenon. Um, the household net worth which gives right, which is comprises value of assets, savings, CPF, has been on the rise consistently uh, for years now. And that in itself has doubled in the last 10, 11 years. Uh, so if you were to chart it, it would just be a consistent rise and rise. And it's just a reflection of how much accumulated wealth there is in Singapore. Um, so that's another unique phenomenon. Uh, then you've got the CPF design. It's four savings. And when you have four savings that can only be predominantly used for housing, then you can imagine how much of that funds actually goes towards financing uh, homes that brings down the, uh, makes properties a bit more affordable mm. once you have a loan. And that also supports and underpins high real estate values here. The next Unique phenomena is we've got very high home ownership rates, which is um, 90 plus percent. Many, many markets, many societies, many countries, um, they're far less, about 50, 60 percent, at most 70 percent. So we've got something um, that's unique here because of that. And that's also because of our HDB policies. When you add all of these up, they do point to um, fundamental factors that supports high real estate prices because everyone's a, 
asset owner. So when prices move up, mm. generally everybody benefits mm. from it. Uh, so there's unlocking of capital and profit that allows you know the mm. upgrading effect to take place and so on and so forth. Right. Um, and and on that note, H HDB has done a marvelous, marvelous job in supplying affordable homes, um, good quality, supported by infrastructure. Um, and, and, and so it becomes a privilege to be a Singaporean because you're given grants um, and, and, and you're buying HDB at now in relative terms to private homes, maybe one third or one quarter of uh, of a condo that might be just next to the HDB flat, H, uh, B2, BTO flat or right. so. So when you consider the uplift um, that happens after MOP and all these factors put together, it basically points to elevated home prices. Now, back to your question, why you know prices have been rising and where do we see things? There's always going to be some headwinds around but barring major headwinds, and we've gone through major ones at the global level, um, and because of new costs that developers will have to absorb that has been thrown at them, when you add it all up, um, a project that would have maybe, they needed to sell at say $2,000 per square foot, now all of a sudden, their costs have gone up to a point where they would have to price it at least 20% higher than let's say five years ago. So, and, and what has given rise, what, what has happened over there? Um, you've got stamp duties have gone up for property developers. Mm. They will have to pass it down and because that mm. adds to their production cost. Right. Interest rates have gone up and most developers, in fact, practically 90 plus percent of developers do borrow money in order to uh, increase their returns on capital. Right. So interest rates have gone up. Now, the new phenomena is uh, the definition of GFA and what is saleable has now changed and that's going to change in May, June this year, mm. uh, which would mean that the saleable strata area calculation is also is going to drop uh, for the same cost. So that's going to affect how they are going to price their new properties going forward. Um, DC rates are constantly being reviewed and mm. the next big one is construction costs. Construction costs has gone up because of COVID-led challenges. There's disruption of supply chain, material costs have gone up and the big one is manpower costs. Mm. <laughs> when you add all of this up, um, uh, prices have just gone up and up and you're right, uh, mass market is in the $2,000 plus uh, territory and which was maybe not long ago quite unthinkable. Right, right. So in, in five years time, <laughs> what, what's, your, yeah, what's, what's your rough crystal ball? Uh, I mean, we're putting a disclaimer here for you yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> your own, own prediction, like where will prices be in, let's say OCR? There are reasons why eventually prices can come down and why Singapore's real estate market can also be tamed. Mm. Uh, so there are unique, uh, there's no such thing as prices will continue to rise and rise and not come down. Right. So there are those. Um, but barring that scenario, uh, I, I think our home prices can continue to rise easily 5, 6% year on year. Mm. So if you were to accumulate that five years from now, um, that could well be about 20 to 30 percent from where we are right now. Right, which is like perhaps the OCR be like 2005 PSF starting from. Right, we'll, we'll come back to, to that to, to end this episode. But uh, um, George, you have a couple of questions. Uh, let's go back to from an uh, existing condo owner's point of view yeah. on the on block process. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll kick start first, then I'll pass to George. Um, do you think it's actually a very tiring process for? the existing owners to kickstart and initiate this, this whole thing in order to achieve 80%. And, and usually, how long does it take before they actually approach a consultancy to, uh, to, to, to come in and then get their lawyers in and, and also the tender bid and all that kind of stuff? Right. So I think it goes back to sequential process. So one is the informal assessment of whether it's viable and whether is it timely. If if the, the honest assessment is, yes, it sounds like a good enough time and we're quite happy with the potential premium. And if on top of that, there are 
push factors, maybe maintenance issues or so, then it should lead to the next step, which would require uh, the owners to requisite for an EOGM. And the purpose of calling for that EOGM is to elect a sales committee. So when you eventually, <coughs> excuse me, when you eventually hold that EOGM, uh, the owners need to come together and elect a committee by giving them uh, express powers as to what they can they can't do. Uh, but the most fundamental would be to engage the services of uh, a property consultant uh, and a lawyer who would need to advise them on the steps ahead, um, guide them through it um, in a setting of a sensible reserve price, what would be the best way of distributing the sale proceeds amongst the different unit types. And many, many times you could have a mixed use development in the development. How do you deal with that? Bearing in mind that sometimes the distribution of share value messes things up. Um, how do you find your balances uh, so that it's fair and equitable to everybody, which is the paramount duty of a sales committee uh, and to act as a trustee for all owners. Having done that and you've engaged your, the services of a lawyer and uh, a property consultant, that's where um, collectively they produce a proposal and thereby calling the second EOGM. Explain to all owners um, that this is the reserve price that we're proposing. And the reserve price by nature means uh, that will be the minimum price that you would receive should the deal be successful. Um, and, uh, and with a view of going to the market and trying to achieve that or a higher price, depending on the outcome of the, market, of the marketing tender. And also go on to explain uh, what it means for each and every of the unit. Because um, while you need to know the global reserve price, but you also need to know how much it means to you specifically for your size or so. Um, timelines, the legal issues, all that would need to be explained. And at the close of that meeting, if an owner feels that they're very happy with the entire proposition, that's when they would need to endorse it by signing on an agreement. That agreement is called a collective sale agreement. A sales committee can have up to a year to uh, solicit for eight, at least 80% consent, written consent to the CSA. And if within that one year, they fail to secure 80%, then obviously that puts the uh, an end to the process. Um, like that, there are multiple, there are several other timelines that they need to work within. So that's pretty much um, the most important timeline. And the moment 80% is obtained, that's when the consultants will put it up for sale by tender, um, you know, market it, draw bids at the close of a tender. If the tender is unsuccessful, then they have, the sales committee has up to 10 weeks to negotiate on a private treaty basis. If that also fails, then they probably have one more shot at another tender exercise before it also comes to a natural end. If the tender or the private treaty negotiation is successful, that it does mean that uh, there would be a binding contract between the developer and majority of the owners, uh, but that would be conditional upon several factors being met. One of the key uh, factors uh, that sets out as a condition precedent would be uh, procuring the consent of the Strata Titles Board or High Court or Supreme Court depending on the nature, uh, that forces the rest of the owners to be a party of the agreement. And then only a developer can complete the purchase, uh, collect, uh, and you know they receive the titles, collapse titles, and then proceed towards redeveloping it also. So in a nutshell, that's kind of the sequence of events. Mm. And many a times you see each project taking a different route, depending on whether they're able to uh, achieve 80% at a sensible enough price, whether they're able to achieve a buyer at that price or more, or whether it's, you know, they need to go through a negotiation below the reserve price, which will require the committee going back to the owners for a fresh new updated mandate below the reserve price. So, Kram, just share with us, like, um, for uh, maybe this, this is like more on like on the ground question, uh, in case some condo sellers uh, are very interested in 
um, the sales committee usually how many people does it include? Like how many people does it comprise of? Do they have are they remunerated for this effort? And um, usually, um, like uh, does it depend on like is it like a twenty man team for a thousand unit project or like how does it work? So the law actually sets out the upper limit and the lower limit. Mm. Uh, so the upper limit is 14. So you can't possibly elect a committee that's more than 14 members. Um, and that's irrespective of the size of the development. Uh, and a minimum would be three. Uh, and there's a need to at least elect three members out of committee members to represent the owners when it you know, you need to litigate over it, which is when you go through a strata titles board application, high court or Supreme Court. So the the, the right fit is, you know, anywhere between three to 14. I mean, there are, um, you know, some wisdom in uh, setting out an odd number size of a committee, so seven, nine, whatever. Uh, but again, what is important is to ensure that all unit types are duly represented mm. uh, in the com committee. And what I mean by that is that you could have mixed use, you could have uh, a development with a wide array of sizes, big, large, medium. And uh, so, so it's important that the voices uh, of all these factions are duly represented uh, in the committee and so that uh, it could lead to the best possible decision um, that's not driven by favoritism what one way or the other. Um, are they remunerated? They're absolutely not. It's a they are volunteers. Job. They are all volunteers, unpaid volunteers. Not only are they unpaid volunteers, they mm. actually have the duty of care to act in the best interest of all owners. Um, and um, the court has likened their role to that of a trustee. Um, and so you do need to be above board. You've got to declare any potential conflict of interest. So, for example, if a committee member is also happens to be a property developer or be working for a property developer, that would be the absolute the first thing that the committee member would need to declare before his or her name is put up for election into the sales committee. Um, whether he has a he or she has an interest in a property consultancy firm, a lawyer that wish to bid for the project. These are all potential conflict of interest. Yet, not to say that he or she can't sit in the committee, but you need to do the right and the timely declaration. So I think just now earlier we mentioned that uh, we are right now like kind of in the mini cycle. Um, does it mean that? So I actually there's a series of questions. So does it mean that number one? Um, whoever is, you know, trying to go for the on-block uh, purchase, they are a lot more cautious or could it be because they are also um, weighing the fact that um, they, won't, they want to go for what might be coming up in the government land sale um, unless, you know, the site plots possess very, very good attributes. Um, and speaking of good attributes, um, maybe I just throw a project name. Uh, just for us to really banter. Um, Euro Asia Park, which is just right beside, um, wouldn't say exactly beside, about 600 odd meters away from Woodley MRT Station, sits on the freehold plots. Um, within 1 km, they have schools, 2 km, they have schools, uh, pretty, pretty good plots, and in the RCR area. Reserve price is at um, $500 million. Um, I guess, in your opinion, it's not cheap. Um, why has there been no takers, number one? And then, um, in your opinion, I think um, sitting on the lens of the homeowners, um, there are also a lot of jittery because they will be thinking, do they sell? And then they also wouldn't want to sell cheap because they are also thinking of their replacement home that is you know, on a higher price point. And then if they were to change from like a four bidder to another four bidder, the overall size would have reduced by 20, 30% to a newer development, probably a 99 years. Uh, what should they do? And then um, should they wait or should they kind of bite the bullet, say, okay, there are no takers, I sell now and then I leverage on opportunity cost, I buy into something else, you know, uh, instead of waiting because there is always an unknown and the developers will then be thinking, should they go for this on block it's or to pay consultancy fee already. go for, you know. So I, I believe this is definitely on I'm a lot of... track with the number of questions. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of In short, is, uh, in short yeah. is what should you yes. do if you're in Euro-Asia Park? 
<laughs> one example, yes. I think it will be more appropriate not to answer in specific terms uh, mm. to any particular project because yep. um, that, there's a lot of unique factors that go into every project's pricing. Of course. So I, I can't comment on, say, 500 million, whether it's a right price or not right of price. Course, yeah. But let's speak in general terms. Mm. So what's happening to the market and why uh, developers are shying away from bidding mm. for on blocks? The answer to that question is... In the past, if they were to buy a piece of land, a non-block, at, say, a certain land value Price, yeah. measured by per square foot per plot ratio, yes. um, you add the construction and mm. all ancillary costs, um, you get uh, a sense of your margin and what you need to sell mm. for. Now, what has happened is because of uh, potential higher replacement costs have gone up. Yep. And rightfully so. It's not driven by greed in an, in any sense. Um, owners find themselves needing the comfort of a larger buffer. sale price buffer. Yes. Mm. So that baseline cost has now gone up. Mm. But in the meantime, even the value add cost, which is construction and miscellaneous interest, has gone up at least 50% arising from all those factors that we just spoke about. So, and, and stamp duties have gone up, yes. risk factors have gone up. Mm. Um, so when you add two and large components, the basic cost for a developer balloons mm. substantially. So while the property might be in a great location, it's got good factors, it's mm. freehold, it's MRT, um, it's in that right sweet spot where there's large amount of home buyers who would like to buy. Um, but for no fault of the owners, um, it's come to a point where the mathematics or the economics do not stack up for the property developers. Mm. So as a result, and this is again a common problem right. that we're finding in most typical on block mm. because of all these struggles and challenges. And so which is why in the past we used to see maybe a one in three success rate. That means for every three on blocks that gets thrown to the market, one tends to find a buyer. Slowly, it's been coming down to one in four, mm. then one in five. Now it's arguably one in ten uh, are successful. So that means for every one successful sale, there are nine that would have got their eighty percent but can't find no a buyer, buyer mm. be just because there is a mismatch between the what pricing. works for a developer and mm. what what works for the for owners. The owners. Basically, right. it's a pricing pricing gap between like the sellers and the buyers, right? So maybe you just want to quick check, right? So from a layman form of estimation, uh, from a developer standpoint, what kind of uh, profit margin will make sense for them to want to go for the on-block? So for example, let's say, you know, like I'm coming from, let's say I'm a retail investor. I want to buy a project that has on-block potential. And I want to know like, okay, if uh, this deal can go through at this kind of pricing, it will work out for developers. So that it means my, my chance of uh, getting on block, if I know some hidden information, uh, there's a high chance for me to proceed. Lah. Okay, so I think there's no simple answer to that question. What kind of hidden information do you have? So like <laughs> hidden information is that like you, you, you roughly, you know, like maybe understand, you know, like you talk to previous owners, oh, roughly, you know, like maybe they, what they are, they are, are aiming, to buy yourself? They are aiming at certain form of reserve <laughs> price. And then from there, you know, you can, okay, this can, can could, it, could, it, could it make sense for like the developer, then you know that probably there's a higher chance that it will go through. Right. In short, in short is um, Crumjit, you yourself, what kind of projects will you buy? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm struggling to think of a sensible way of answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, again, you can't answer the question by looking at a particular project's uh, absolute price because uh, five years ago, that same absolute price could have resulted in uh, uh, a particular break-even and a, a needful sale price. But now circumstances have all changed that the same price uh, requires the developer to mark up the project by potentially 15 20% more than previously. So then the question uh, arises is, 
can the end market support mm. the elevated sale prices? Um, and if you take a view, you take an aggressive uh, view and you like to go for it, then that's fine. But then it's a question of whether the developer has alternatives. If they have alternatives in the form of GLS and, and, and they prefer the safety of that, um, then I think that probably explains why most developers will just shy away from uh, on blocks. So again, it's 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 about the add-on cost that has basically messed up uh, the economics, um, and that has messed up uh, whether an on block is likely to be successful or not. Um, and I'll just give you an example. Uh, not long ago, when a developer buys a piece of land, they needed to pay three percent stamp duty on the value of the land. Today is 11%. So that extra bit has to go somewhere. So should the owners be absorbing that? Uh, why should the owners absorb that? Because they will be thinking about replacement homes that have not gone down but has gone up. So if the owners are not absorbing that, and that's one of the multiple factors that have changed, then who's to absorb that? So inevitably, it ends up with the end bias of the new condo, you know, needing to pay, you know, a higher and higher price for that. But there's a limit to how much you can push that because, again, back to whether there are alternatives. If there are alternatives, uh, that probably explains why an on block will not, that particular on block will not take place. So I think usually if we look at the reserve value and then we try to break it down into the per square foot uh, PPR per plot ratio, we will roughly know whether the asking from the sellers are actually sort of like overpriced in the current context. Correct. So that's a very transparent thing. There's a lot of information that's available in the public domain um, as to how developers are, what developers are paying uh, for a piece of land. And, you know, when you have enough of comparables, then it, it, it basically, it tells the owners whether are they on the right part? Are they pricing it right competitively enough to be able to attract bids? And, um, or if they've inbuilt a premium just because they need the comfort of that, then they need to understand um, that the probability will be low. Then they will have to ask themselves whether should they even go through that process because there is a downside of going through an on-block process only to fail with with it because it disrupts, you know, um, the it disrupts what an owner can do, should not do, should they put a renovation on hold at the unit level or at the condo level. Um, so there's something that you will have to give for you know, making an attempt there. So it, it's not that it's a costly affair, but it's a potentially disruptive affair that times tends to lead to some anxiety issues. Kramji, if we remove um, two factors from good attributes of a project that has potential to on-block. So, for example, let us remove the human factor. I mean, like, in the market, there's this term that uh, in certain projects, there might be a group of uh, owners that are not um, receptive to the concept of on-block because of replacement home and all that kind of stuff. So, let's maybe we remove the human factor from, from the attributes list. And then the second factor to remove is, okay, uh, maybe let us remove... Although it's very hard to remove, but uh, let us remove the, the part whereby the owners collectively want to achieve a certain reserve price. So let's remove that as well. So bearing that two attributes being removed, what are the rest of the attributes that usually um, attracts developers who want to bid for a certain type of project? Like, is it like huge car park lot spaces that are not, you know, utilized and, and port ratios and ratios. things like that? What are some of these things that maybe you can share with our audience? Well, actually, what is currently on site doesn't quite matter to a developer because they will raise it down, they will tear it down and build afresh. Uh, whether it's got existing surface car park, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, um, it's not relevant uh, to uh, whether they wish to bid, bid for it or not. Um, what could go wrong when they assess a piece of land is if the component of development charges uh, which is a tax payable upon redeveloping or applying to redevelop it, is high in proportion to the entire land cost, then they can potentially be exposed to needing to pay higher rates if from the point of purchase, 
um, to the time that they make the application, there is at least one or two DC rate increments along the way because DC rates are adjusted every six months. So many developers, some developers, have been exposed to a situation where in their minds they thought that they would be paying, say, $200 million in D DC, or now it's known as land betterment charge. Um, uh, but the end result, having gone through the entire process, that 200 million may balloon to, say, 300 million because of a variety of factors. So they would need to assess whether are the risk factors in that particular on block high. Uh, there are on blocks where actually the DC amount uh, is small in proportion to the entire land value. So it would basically point that the risk factors in those situations are much more manageable. So that's one. Then obviously they will have to look at marketability of that pro, uh, of that project uh, in the context of you know the target audience who's going to likely buy. Are there BTOs with MOPs that will be just nice for them to be targeted to? Um, good schools, MRT stations, shopping malls, distance, commute times to CBD, all these factors, uh, views. Um, so. Once they've taken a complete assessment of that, that's when they can also internalize a view that they're taking off the market because when they buy a piece of land, they can only launch it potentially 15 months or sometimes 18 months after purchase. So they will have to kind of keep an eye as to where they think the market would be uh, one and a half to two years to three years from that point of time. If they're obviously bearish about the market, then no, no developer is going to buy. If they think it's going to be stagnant, then they will not be very too aggressive about bidding. And if they are reasonably confident and prepared to take the risk that you know there's probably upside about it, that's when they know that they will have to be competitive against other potential bidders. So when we talk about um, competitions as such, um, especially when, let's say, they have unblock this particular project and then surrounding there there is a series of government land sale that has yet to be launched how would this potentially affect um you know the outlook of this particular project that is about to go for on block very good question so it's all, all about again a marketability assessment so what's the oversupply situation undersupply situation uh, when was the last project in that localized area launch uh, was it reasonably successful uh, what's going to compete at around the same time um, so these are all factors that will have to be taken into consideration um, in in actually making a decision uh, and that's not to say that there is since there is another competing project that might uh, be heading towards the same time launch uh, that a developer should not uh, partake because sometimes GLS also does spring those kind of situations where you can have two sites in the same area um, that's launched and closed at the same time. Um, so the Lentor area is one good example. Um, and so developers will just have to price that situation and making an assessment about it. And if it needs uh, to be a bit more cautious and price that in, um, then that then so be it. Right. So speaking of Lentor, um, there's there's only one bidder for Lentor Gardens, uh, and that was uh, the latest plot. Yes, uh, I think the price was at nine hundred plus uh, per per square foot per plot ratio. So um, is this a sign that you know the market is softening, uh, given the the one bidder that only bids for it, or are they waiting for other land plots uh, to be available? For example, uh, Bayshore. Yeah. Bayshore is more BTO. Yes. Um, so it doesn't really play into developers' mind because they don't partake in that. Uh, one bidder, what does that mean? Um, uh, and the bid price was marginally lower than the, the, the other sites that closed yep. uh, several months back. Multiple factors. One is, yes, maybe an assessment that there might be some pushback um, or indigestion because of the supply in that localized area. Um, secondly, whoever's bidding it 
will have to price in higher stamp duties mm. arising from the latest budget in February. They will have to also price in um, the new age construction costs and also what is known as this new f- f- calculation of uh, what constitute GFA and what's the strata area. And, and that will give rise to a drop in saleable efficiency. Mm. So when you factor that, then um, the price that they bid it actually sounds reasonable, fan reasonable. Uh, but because are they, because they're the only bidder, does that uh, send a wider signal by the market or the view of developers across the wider uh, market? Um, they, they definitely are concerns about factors that are beyond their control. Uh, interest rates, uh, high stamp duties, high construction costs. At some point of time, construction costs as a risk factor will normalize, mm. uh, will will come down. At some point of time, high interest rates may normalize, but nobody can put a finger to when that will happen mm. and to what extent will they start come stabilizing down to. So that's beyond their control. Um, but I think developers do recognize that um, there is an overall need to buy land and supply because... Um, there is inherently demand for well-priced, well-designed, well-located uh, condos, especially mass market. Um, so I think business would pre- resume back to normal when you have other GLS tenders closing. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be one bidder in those cases. Uh, it's not going to be a flood of bids. Uh, a lot of it depends on the scale of the project and whether it's mixed use and other factors. Do you think developers are still hungry for land now? Generally speaking, yes, that would be the answer. Um, But they're also finding themselves in a difficult situation as to how to go about competing with one another because they also need to be prudent and sensible about bidding. Uh, But many a times when they, in their minds, are prudent and sensible about bidding, they don't win it then is whether do they compete and take that undue risk about all the factors that are beyond their control um, or, or, or or just shy away from uh, bidding. Fundamentally, uh, if they're given an opportunity to buy land at fair value, uh, there will be no shortage of developers bidding for it. Right. So following up from Melvin's question, so are there like uh, attributes or like checklists that if let's say a land site fulfills, there will be a higher chance of on block. I mean, like from a layman perspective, is definitely I think like uh, the developer must be able to build maybe at least you know twice number of units, either increase of because of the increase of plot ratio, or maybe because the current housing per unit the the, the size is big, and I can split it into maybe half. You're still trying to find your 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 golden pot, is it? Like, uh, or why don't you just ask uh, Crumbjit directly? Which one will <laughs> be successful over? <laughs> I, I would say most of quite a number probably will not. But actually, also interestingly, um, there are also non-resi like um, Shenton, Shenton House and Peninsula Excelsior Hotel. So do, do you think there will be also developers that will go for this type of um, property of actually, plot in, nature? In, in, in the current um, way that things are going, do you think actually like this kind of commercial sites are actually more attractive yeah. to in the eyes of a developer? Of course, going back to Yurong's question, so the attributes. <laughs> um, so maybe I start with the simplest question first. <laughs> so yes, interestingly, mixed-use development projects um, are beginning to creep in in being a bit more successful than the plain vanilla on blocks. Mm. And that's because of the unique uh, addition of costs that's attributable to residential properties, the mm. high stamp duties or so. Uh, some of these mixed use on blocks uh, represent an opportunity for the buyer to refurbish them rather than tear down and redevelop it, especially if they've got a renting model in mind uh, for these kind of projects. So then the high construction cost becomes lesser of a factor in when they plan for the refurbishment or a and for it. Um, so that's on that question. Um, factors, well, ultimately... Every project, yeah, it comes down to, you know, perception of price in relation to what they can do with the property in that and 
again, applying a different lens unique to each developer as to what the outlook of the market is expected to be. Um, there are developers who are obviously more uh, risk adverse, some are risk takers, some believe that they will have to accumulate supply because they're running short of inventory. So mm. that would force them to take a bit more risk in, in bidding. Uh, so it's all about unique factors to the developers, but fundamentally there's no running away from the fact that it must make sense um, economically mm. for both the sellers and the buyers. And many a times there is that pricing gap that you just spoke about. And if the pricing gap can't be bridged, uh, no issues with developers not bidding for it. How about like projects whereby, you know, it, it seems like just from the look of it, um, it has been already maxed out, right? Uh, in terms of this land size, there's no increment in plot ratio. There's no increment in the amount of levels you can build. Yeah, yeah. I mean like, should the owners even try to attempt to, to, to uh, do so it? So the answer to that is that it's it, it doesn't matter. It, there are very successful on blocks that have that 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 have no upside in plot ratio, so to speak. That means the GFA has been maxed out. Um, and it's just a matter of the developer pulling it down and redeveloping, keeping the same gross floor area, but they're free to reconfigure the sizes. Right. Um, so the very fact that you've already maxed out your potential in relation to the redevelopment potential doesn't mean that a project like that is non-unblockable, right. uh, for lack of a better word. Mm. Um, so, um, and, and the reason that can still give rise to an on-block opportunity despite uh, maxed out GFA is there is always a huge premium that gets attributed to brand new uh, projects compared to resale projects. Mm. So when you take that into consideration and when you apply the improvement cost, which is your construction cost and mis miscellaneous, if there's still an arbitrage, yeah, developers will go for that. Right. Have you ever seen any projects that has been successfully on block uh, for those projects that are below 10 years old? Very, very rare. I, I, I Because you need 90%. You need 90%. You are absolutely yeah. right. Have there been any success cases in Singapore? I can't think of a project off the top of my head, but there could have been, not recently, certainly not recently, but in the past, in, in one of those previous cycles, there could have been, but uh, nothing pops out. Right. Uh, there have been attempts that I'm, we are aware of, uh, but in most cases, we've been advising the owners, you know, it's probably better to, uh, to wait this out because... Um, it's very difficult to engineer uh, a sensible price that, you know, bearing in mind that the project is still reasonably new. Uh, and if you have, then then it's, it's, it's a bit of an economic loss also, pulling down a perfectly well-built development that's in a good condition, new, uh, just to replace it in all probability with the same GFA, but brand new form. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so if let's say, this group of homeowners, they are the OGs of this development. That means majority of them, yeah, they are like the first owners. This also means that their buffer is significantly higher than say a second or a third owner. Um, of course, they have to go for a replacement home. Does it mean that um, this type of demographics will then have a slightly more flexible reserve price? And then this gap will then be able to address does, does this uh, factor actually even uh, plays a part in the resulting success of an on-block sale? Mm, difficult to generalize. Mm. Difficult to generalize because you're right also, while they might be sitting on uh, historical low purchase prices, and so you would imagine they would be, you know, quite comfortable with not maximizing or perceiving to maximize their sale price and they will be more uh, flexible. But I think most owners ignore what they paid for it maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, but look upon the on-block proposition in relation to what it's currently worth because that's actually their opportunity cost. If the opportunity cost is S they are able to sell that at f 2 million, for example, never mind that they paid 200,000 for it uh, many decades ago, and um, the on-block proposition is 2.5, then they might struggle with that half a million 
uh, premium respect so they they will be having an eye more of what is it currently worth and because that also tells them what they would need to spend when looking for a replacement mm. home uh, ignoring the fact that they they might have paid 200,000 or 300,000 so it doesn't really matter almost doesn't really yeah. matter yeah okay so, so 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 sometimes i see that like you know like uh so for some projects uh the third time is the charm uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there are some cases and there's probably some evidence and it's probably a case where they've wisened up mm. adjust their expectations uh, they've adjusted uh, they've, mm. they've, they've learned from previous exercises they've learned from the failed attempts that guys this time let's get it right you know they wouldn't be able to know that they missed the opportunity in the previous two times mm. maybe they were late in the cycle and the timing was off but usually it's a question of having priced it over the market and uh, so they if they've learned from that um, and have adjusted in relation to the market and since the first and second time the market also is on their side having gone up then uh, that's where the confluence of factors uh, lead to a high probability in your third time charming uh, situation. I see. So some basic questions. Uh. So uh, when they first put up for uh, tender, how long were, how, how, how long are developers given to actually partake in the bidding? So how long does a tender is open yeah, for? Open. Usually for about anywhere between four to six weeks. So four to six weeks. If it's not successful, they can do a private treaty for up to 10, 10 weeks. Dimensions. That's correct. And then if let's say they still fail to secure a buyer, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that they can still go have a one last chance in terms of uh, trying for like a tender. Uh, they they can call for a second tender, and if time permits, they could potentially even call for uh, a third tender. Usually, a very short third tender, because all of that has to be managed within twelve months from the time that they did secure eighty percent, and within that twelve months, they would need to secure a buyer and make an application to the Strata Titles Board which that process also takes maybe sometimes six to eight weeks or so. Mm. So when you factor that, then effectively they've got 10 to 10 and a half months to actually market it. And then once you factor the tender, typical reasonable tender process, then most on blocks have two shots at it, sometimes three shots at it. Within the same 12 month cycle. That's mm. right. Mm, okay, nice. From, I, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. I, 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 I spoke to an investor before that told me he was successful three times in terms of identifying an M-Block project. And then uh, these are the tips that he gave me. So he mentioned that, okay, maybe not too big a land size, 300 to 400 million dollars worth. So it's easier for the, uh, for the developer. developers to digest. Uh, he personally prefers uh, a freehold property attribute from the angle that he understand that he might need to hold for 10 years right. before the end block can happen. And uh, he is okay that even if the end block doesn't happen because it's freehold. And his viewpoint is that once the more senior uh, owners who want to a house who probably will object to the end block because of like, you know, like needing to change a new environment, they don't if they were to pass on, the beneficiaries would be open to want to have an end block. So that's... How do you find this strategy? Uh, there are quite a number of <laughs> <laughs> seasoned investors. <laughs> Successful uh, on block because... Correct. Right. Uh, but the key thing that you would notice is that um, chances are they would have the luxury of being uh, able to wait out. Uh, but if you are boring to the hilt and you're sitting on tight cash flows um, and, and, and high boring is a risk factor, um, then you would want a, a quick turnaround as much as possible. And if you're gaming for that, then, then that's not a good idea uh, because of all these uh, challenges of you know, being successful. But if you're prepared and you've, you've got the means to wait it out, then I think these are all very good and relevant and uh, uh, and, and relevant, basically, fact success factors to look out for. Um, uh, in addition to that, if obviously the, the, the project has unblocked before and have basically warmed up mm. to the whole phenomena, then that would add, be the added bonus, so to speak. 
um, you pointed out to if the next generation uh, typically will become less emotive, emotively attached to the property. Yes, that's potentially uh, a relevant factor. Um, but yeah, if an investor can wait it out, take the risk, sit it out. If it doesn't happen within three to five years and they can take at least a 10-year view, why not? So should um, a family that wouldn't want an on block to happen, but they just like this particular project that has failed twice in its on block, should they still buy it? <laughs> just to stay. Yeah, and adding, adding on to that question, right? Um, because we talk about the timeline, which is um, if let's say when they are purchasing it, there are no talks of on block. Suddenly, the moment after they purchase it and then the plot ratio change and then after they started to attract, uh, you know, potential on block discussion, the timeline will then be about will definitely be more than a year to form the 80% and then to find a buyer. Is it also true that, uh, adding to Melvin's question, is that by the time, let's say, they manage to find a buyer, it would be within the second or the third year of the seller's stamp duty cycle? Yes, they would be exposed, potentially exposed to uh, SS, SSD liability and, and that will still be applicable to an owner who doesn't support the on block. So uh, because they are being forced to an arrangement and um, uh, so they would still be exposed to SSD. And if and, and based on the uh, example that you've just outlined that it gets kickstarted just after buying it, then yeah, it's within three years. It's a very real probability. Um, as for an owner who's looking to buy for own stay and prefers not to be disrupted by an on block, I would say the best would be buy landed. Because uh, in landed, you, you can't be forced out because the 80% rule doesn't apply. And if you, if you hold your ground and you say that you don't wish to sell with your adjoining landed property owners for redevelopment, for example, uh, you could say no. Right. Um, like but, the one in the Geelang. Yeah, that, that reminds me of the one yeah. in the Geelang. So like all the yeah. owners beside them so and then they, they yeah, create a very the only interesting one development. Sandwich. Yeah. So that, that's the, uh, the... There are multiple examples in the mm. past, um, especially row of terraces where, you know, you have many of them saying yes, but some said no. Then um, there are more additional challenges right now because in those kind of situations, uh, you are a, do impose minimum land area before uh, a row of terraces can be redeveloped into maybe a different housing form. So you need to look at not only the land area of the plot that is willing to sell, but also what is known as the breakaway lot in that row. So it just opens up a different can of worms there. Right. Right. Um, the last topic um, that we want to prick your brains. So, <laughs> so we were debating on this on the last episode. Um, this, is, this is where we are at right now. Uh, we are in Q2 2023 and um, our landed price index, non-landed residential price index, HDB price index. Uh, what is your own personal forecast? Of course, we'll put in the disclaimer for, for you again. <laughs> but what is your own personal forecast? Because we're, we're like uh, debating on the fact that um, recently HDB policies has attracted, I mean, HDB prices has attracted a lot of policies. I mean, including the latest round where uh, a owner have to wait out 15 months before they can purchase unless they are at least 55 and above and, and things like that. So where do you think this this line will, will eventually go to? Do you think that um, it will sort of taper? And what do you think will happen to our condo and apartment pricing as well as landed property pricing in the next five years? So we're just trying to look at, will there be a huge uh, gap between public housing as well as private properties, looking at how things are going, because it does seem like private properties are picking up a lot of strength, especially with the reopening of a lot of global countries. There's, there's a huge viewpoint that Singapore now is like one of the very top tier safe haven uh, from regional, from overseas investors. Everybody's fleeing and, and trying to put their, their money in countries that has sound governance and things like that. So what, what do you think is going to happen in, in future? I mean, of course, um, our government has done a lot of job in terms of ensuring that everybody has a chance to own their own properties, whether it's a BTU or resale, uh, HDBs or, or things like that. So, so your personal viewpoint on, on pricing moving forward. No simple <laughs> answers to that. Um, but um, this, this pertains general, to the yeah, next generation. Yeah. Yeah. So the general principles about 
if you look at this chart, you would see, you know, it's it's cyclical, generally cyclical. So there's no way that uh, we would see a situation where prices will just rise and not come down, not dip. Uh, why would prices come down? Prices will come down whenever there is an inherent weakness in the economy where people are not earning as much as they did. There is shrinkage of, sh of savings, but more importantly, where there is a supply glut. Uh, and and in, whenever you look back in history, when prices came down, it's largely because of a supply glut situation. Right now, we've got headwinds, but we don't have a supply glut. We've got supply. It's undersupply. Um, so which is why prices are still moving up. Um, now, but that's just summing up um, the essence of it. But there are multiple back issues connecting with generally how as a nation, we're thinking about uh, the profile of the Im immigrants that are coming on board, um, you know, the, the population growth arising from immigration, uh, because we do have a declining population uh, trend. So obviously, we're not reproducing enough to uh, replace ourselves. So the only way that we could increase our population base is through immigration. Um, so then, so that comes into factor. Then obviously marriage uh, rate, the number of marriages that forms new households has a part to play. Um, fundamentally, you've got a situation where new, new people have come on uh, and because of high stamp duties, they find themselves that they can't buy as they come into Singapore uh, just so immediately because of high stamp duties as, as a foreigner. So they rent. Um, there's a shortage of homes for a whole variety of reasons why rents have gone up. So they will need to see whether is that sustainable. Um, um, but because HDB and private, uh, if you look back in history, you would find that they are actually quite closely correlated. Uh, if HDB prices remain weak, it has a knock-on effect on the entry level of private condominiums because affordability of private condominiums is in turn uh, dependent on the ability to H, uh, of HDB dwellers in being able to sell and upgrade and you know depends on how much pre premium they're able to make, so on and so forth. So, uh, so I doubt it would diverge uh, to the extent uh, that you've just outlined. Um, they would come together uh, in the ups and lows also, the luxury end of, of, of properties and landed have a life of their own, uh, less correlated to the fundamentals of HDB and mass market. Uh, landed is living in its own bubble and they can afford to live in its own bubble because there's no new landed supply, um, you know. So, and while wealth is on the rise, it's only that many landed properties. So um, this will be your chart. Uh, that's your <laughs> chart. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then luxury is a different thing altogether again, because it's all about, um, you know, the profile of parties who are coming in and paying top dollar for luxury home and with a huge surplus in the form of stamp duties, and they would need to take a look at the entire quantum that they're paying, the base cost plus stamp duties in totality in making a decision whether they are you know, going for it. And then there's still quite a number of cases where uh, foreigners have bought high-end homes and have paid almost 40% in stamp duties. And that's huge. In, in your personal recommendation to a friend, if somebody, if your friend of yours is able to, uh, I mean, like afford a landed home, and uh, as well as a CCR condominium, what would you advise your friend? Well, I would say landed, landed easily because uh, landed still appeals to Singaporean wealthy Singaporeans uh, who potentially could pay less stamp duties. Uh, luxury and uh, there's a higher probability that you would need to target foreigners. And with the rate at which ABSD has been on the rise, I, I don't see ABSD coming down. So it's either remaining where it is or if not go up, you know, over time. So, so the risk factors would continue to rise. Um, and, uh, and, and that seems if their buy is a Singaporean then, and you, 
are you have the ability to pay uh, to buy landed, then I think landed would be the way to go. So I, I was very happy with uh, your answer because I did a V shape because uh, in the last episode I mentioned that the lender and HDB cannot just have like a total full divergence. There's some form of correlation. Of course, the, the gap will widen and come out. You mentioned that the previous cycles, of course, uh, usually prices come down because of supply glut, right? Uh, but I, I wanted to just clarify, actually, a lot of the previous situation when prices came down, it was usually created uh, correlated to like a global or regional crisis, like Asian financial crisis, dot-com bubble, uh, GFC. Of course, the from 2013 onwards, we have this, series of cooling measures that sort of like, you know, I of course understand that prices cannot just come out on a straight line. There will be a certain form of pullback. Uh, but can we say that with all these cooling measures in place, they are sufficient enough to not have the market crash, like last time used to be like 40% kind of crashing. And maybe the, the uh, a pullback will be something more like uh, what we see in 2013 when total debt surfacing ratio is implemented 3 to 4% down on a yearly basis. And that is what? is considered our worst case scenario from a residential context in Singapore. I think you've, you've, you've outlined a very good point. Um, uh, ironically, what appears to be um, the risk factor in investing in Singapore is actually our saving grace. Uh, it basically, the cooling measures, the accumulated set of cooling measures have ensured that our prices have not run away from fundamentals. We are nowhere close to a bubble market. Uh, and there's a lot of talk that, you know, Singapore is in a bubble and many other countries and markets do see bubbles taking place because of a lack of regulation. But because we're so highly regulated, we our, our market is, I would dare say, it's very grounded. So, and in fact, uh, we did a report precisely on this in the face of COVID and we made that prediction that we don't see prices coming down despite COVID purely underpinned by the strength of the market arising from the cooling measures. Mm. That has ensured that market remains prudent, borrowing remains prudent and, and home buyers would only do so if they actually have the ability to make a purchase or upgrade or downgrade, whichever the case is. So, so that is actually a huge strength factor that will precisely mitigate the, our downside. Mm. Um, but, but you've also touched on, on all other points. We've seen prices coming down during the global financial crisis, but that also coincided with a supply glut situation mm. at that point of time. We went through another, another major economic crisis, a global economic crisis in the form of COVID that basically messed up yeah, the uh, many markets mm. uh, disrupted uh, and and contracted and and and, and diminished uh, wealth in many markets, and yet our prices didn't go down, and that's because it coincided with the situation where we were undersupplied. Mm. So um, so that's the key difference between why it behaved differently in those different major global uh, economic crisis. So in 2021, 2022, will you attribute uh, mainly because we are in an undersupply situation and uh, of course, maybe the spillover effect of uh, the printing of cheap money from the US, all this as a combined factor for the price run in the 2021 and to 2022. And also the, the, the prudence and the strength that 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 is inherent in the market mm. arising from the prudence instilled by the cooling measures. Okay, but why did not why didn't prices already start climbing, let's say, you know, like uh, in 2019? Because, uh, I mean, like in terms of like the CPF uh, savings rate building and all that, these are all factors or like income increases. These are all factors that has already been present for like a long time. Supply situation. Mm. So it became more and more uh, apparent that the market was heading towards a lower supply overhang than ever before. Uh, and that's that's. That's why you see that huge uh, jump up in prices. What are your thoughts about the recent bank crisis in the US and uh, combined with the interest rate effect? What are your own personal, I would say, I would, I would, I would say predictions on like how the market will perform in 2023 and 2024? The factors that led to those um, banks from being bought out are actually quite unique 
uh, to decisions made by those banks, or at least that would be what appears to be the case. Um, the key question is whether that would lead to a contagion effect that will lead to a domino that messes up and disrupts the global order, the banking order is yet to be seen. Uh, I think it's difficult to say that it's heading in that direction just as yet. There are so many differing views amongst experts in that space. And we are obviously, I'm not an expert in that space. Um, closer towards home, you know, you would recall during the Asian financial crisis, we had multiple banks and uh, the government basically forced uh, the mergers of the smaller banks towards three main local banks. And the three main local banks are, I think, sitting on very solid uh, balance sheets. They're doing exceptionally well. They've recovered and performed well arising from the last COVID crisis. So I think they're sitting on, they're in good shape. And bulk of our our assets are with the three local banks. Uh, so that gives some comfort and there's a lot of prudence in the management of the financial systems. But there are absolutely risk factors. I mean, uh, the collapsing of the banks, high interest rates, the management of that, um, you know, the, the, the ability to get... Well, there's also a sem semblance that many have got into speculative investments, whether you place crypto or, or different forms of um, uh, new instruments in that category it depends on how much wealth is created, how much wealth is lost. Uh, and and it, the key question is whether if, is that happening in small pockets along the whole way? And if that's the case, then I think we should be fine. Um, your last point is on high interest rates. That definitely has a knock-on effect on the ability to service loan. Um, the good news is um, while asset values have continued to climb, household wealth and savings have continued to climb. Uh, overall debt, while that has climbed, but it has not climbed in tandem with the values of household in, uh, wealth. So 10 years ago, um, debt used to be about 20% of asset value or household net worth. Today, it has, although in absolute terms it's gone up, it's only, it's come down to 14%. Uh, and that's because it has remained prudent uh, with TD TDSR as a control mechanism. But more importantly, wealth has continued to drive the accumulated uh, household wealth as a, as a society. Great, awesome. Okay, final question because yeah. of time constraint from George. Yeah, so um, do you foresee uh, home ownership to reduce? from the fact that um, TDSR have actually dropped down to the current state of 55%. And then um, I think a lot of um, youngsters right now, uh, probably 20 years down the road, they are thinking might be different. Instead of putting a huge chunk in terms of the uh, down payment um, to the house, right now it's 25%. I don't know, you know, 20 years down the road, how many percent would it be? Do you think they will then be shifting their mindset into rental apartments instead of buying a house? The answer to that is um, in, we've got to look at who we are as a society. Um, the Asian society prefers, you know, home ownership rather than being feeling vulnerable about uh, needing to move as a tenant. Many other societies are quite comfortable uh, moving around, not owning your home. Um, Asian societies have this tendency towards um, building a legacy and saving for your next generation. Right or wrong, it's arguable, but it's very ingrained in our Asian society. So we save, we work hard, but we also, you know, keeping for the next generation and maybe grandsons and so on and so forth. So, now you've got to ask yourself whether has that culture changed over time? Um, and so that might point to different answers. Um, the alternative, there's some argument towards, you know, renting, but many a times when you look back in history, uh, Singapore has remained a, a very good performing housing market. 
So if they were to not be invested when everybody else, 90 plus percent of our society is a property owner, um, then there might be a chance and there's a high risk that they might just miss the opportunity having climbed down the ladder to eventually climb up the ladder uh, at a later point of time because prices just tend to rise uh, gradually over time. Um, so they will have to figure that out. Foreigners have no choice uh, to be tilted towards rental because of high stamp duties. Um, is that good or bad? Well, if you're a local, obviously, you will feel that that adds to a layer of protection, uh, ensuring that property prices remain as affordable as they can pot potentially be, uh, favoring locals against foreigners. Uh, if you're a foreigner, obviously, you know, <laughs> this would be an issue. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe um, just one uh, uh, question because of time constraint. So, uh, Kramjit, what advice would you have for uh, our young people in Singapore? I mean, if you can give like one to two advices for them uh, to plan for their future uh, with relation to, of course, their, their own personal well-being as well as like planning for, for their, their home as well. Yeah. Well, I think we here in Singapore, and this might sound... Uh, like a politician here, but I'm not. <laughs> but I do genuinely admire the entire HDB infrastructure and the social objectives behind uh, the the design of the policies, uh, the economics around the grants, uh, the subsidy at which it's being offered, uh, the the quality of the bill. Um, they are literally world class. Now. All you need to do is to catch a flight and travel about the world. Then only you will come back and realize that actually we've got a, 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 a very generous um, and, and, a, and a beautiful way of starting off their life once you get married um, and to BTO, your, your beginning journey of your, your married life. Um, so whether it's going to be five years tied down, whether it's 10 years tied down, and now you've got uh, options of being able to own a HDB flat in a prime located. And that's, I think it's phenomenal. I think it's a, it's a great way of, of starting off your life. It's a prudent way of tying down less debt um, and less capital involved so that you could live comfortably with ideally CPF taking care of the installments. Um, and then while you focus on developing your career, working hard in, in, in an upliftment in your earning potential, and then over that five or 10 years period, uh, you enjoy the uplift in your HDP flat or BTOs. Um, and whether you would like to carry on living in that or whether you feel that you would like to put more and more of your earnings, future earnings and savings into a new home, be able so that you can able to live a certain lifestyle that's a trade-off that you will have to make at that point of time um there's nothing wrong in staying in a heb flat it's i think it's a very wise thing to do even after mop uh, because um, it just means that you will have a larger amount of disposal income for a different quality of life or you could use that for a form of investments uh, or, or, or enterprise or so um, now, but if they are totally game for it and they've got the ability to afford, absolutely by no by by uh, they, by all means, they could think about replacing it and upgrading. But the good thing is that you've got frameworks that ensures prudency in what you can, what you can't do, um, and 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 because parents are usually property owners. Um, Again, because back to Asian culture, a lot of parents do save up for the kids. And that's where parents do come in handy to, to help uh, get them off their grounds and as they start their life together as a married couple. So a combination of these cultural aspects and the, the, the great HDB machinery that we have here, uh, and I would dare say it's a very generous grant, um, I, I think this would be the ideal way of, of kick-starting your life. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for your time today. It means a lot to, to us and uh, our audience. I think we have learned a great deal about OnBlock and uh, a lot of um, questions has been answered. And uh, 
Um, we want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Kramjit uh, basically for his precious time here. So if you want to find out more about what he does and um, of course on his uh, LinkedIn profile and company profile, the links are all provided down in the description box below. And uh, feel free to reach him. Um, are you open for our audience to reach you? I mean, like if you have any questions about on block and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm ha Would happy to help out. So right, yeah, I, think, I can, I I think can they share can. with my email address here. Right, right awesome, great. So uh, thank you for staying tuned on our banter series uh, number the seventh uh, in terms of our episode and we will want to see you on the next one so what we're going to do is that everyone we're going to bring on a different guest um, as far as we can of course country if you have anybody that you want to recommend to come on to our podcast uh, feel free to to ping me sure. and uh, we hope to see you soon take care bye last time I used to buy my house through Yirong <laughs> yeah, so that was about um, almost 10 years ago already. Yeah, so he's, he's, he's a veteran. What's your relationship with Mr. Conrad? He's my client. <laughs> <laughs> oh, keep it at that, yeah. <laughs>